Spurs, and welcome to this Sunday's church service. And there's our dog. That's our dog, Lexi. Lexi. Everybody. Um, welcome to our morning worship. Let's take a moment to greet one another with our, as we do, our, our kind of Brady Bunch waves, sharing God's love and grace with one another. Here comes Christy too and Robin in the background. Yeah. Grateful to see your faces and to be able to gather together and worship. A um, couple of exciting things this week. It's quite a birthday week. Um, Olivia Stanley and Gracie Weed have birthdays today. So happy birthday to them. I believe Olivia Stanley is out in Arizona going to college and Gracie just started high school. Um, so can, uh, happy birthday to them. Um, Wanda Young has a birthday on uh, Tuesday. Happy birthday to you. Anna Nargat on Wednesday. Geneva Langley on Thursday. And Debbie Hammond and I share a birthday on Friday. So um, that's what's going on this week for birthdays. If you have other celebrations or anniversaries that we could lift up in, in praise, I hope you'll chat them by way of our, our Facebook, I mean, uh, what platform, our Zoom chat um, here. Let's celebrate them together. Also, um, for prayer requests, you can use the Zoom chat function. You can also text me uh, at 207-266-9026. And I mentioned those two differences that occurred to me today, and you'll see why. Um, as, as we share a prayer by way of Zoom, it, um, if it's uh, shared with everyone, um, then everyone can see it and we know who it's from. And so that's one way that we lift up your prayer. Um, if you share a prayer by way of um, texting me at 266-9026, um, I can just share that prayer without having the attribution of who it's from. So um, either way obviously works most of the time and we'll try to do even better at that um, this week. A couple other things. Um, if you'd love to participate in our service, we'd love to have you. Um, open tables happening this week, Tuesday morning prayer, Thursday morning prayer. Um, we are resuming the saunters. Good news, our test group last week uh, had a little saunter about town on Thursday at uh, 10 o'clock and found it to be a palatable experience, was not overwhelmed by tourists. So we'd love to you, for you to join that if you'd like. Um, Fresh Food Fridays at the Bar Harbor Food Pantry on the mornings. Um, Bible study Friday by way of Zoom or Zoom Plus as we call it. Um, really exciting. The weather looks fairly promising for one week from today for another outdoor worship service at the Bar Harbor Historical Society. Um, last time it was beautiful, just a perfectly beautiful day. And I said, I can go one more layer. And I think, I'm not even sure we'll have to next Sunday. So um, if you'd like, bring a little blanket to keep yourself snug as a bug and a rug. And we will um, have our worship service outside. We are planning to have our worship service outside next Sunday. Um, also next Sunday at 2 o'clock, um, it's Bar Harbor Congregation Church apple picking at Johnston's Orchards up in Ellsworth. I will double check to make sure that they're open. I'm sure they are since it's outdoors. Um, and then also next Sunday, the 27th at 545, uh, high school youth are invited to Hadley Point for a, or a little bonfire um, and a blessing. So that's what's going on next week. 
Two weeks from today at one o'clock in the afternoon is going to be our annual blessing of the animal service on the village green. So you can just look over the horizon to that. Um, if there's anything else you need, I hope you'll give me a call. And again, the number for, um, for texting your prayers is 207-266-9026, or you can do that on our Zoom chat. We'll begin our service by lighting our candles. Beloved, we gather together in the grace and love of God. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. That the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice, Let us rejoice and, be glad in it. and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Join together in the call to worship. As the word of God came to Moses, so the word of God comes to us. Go, despite our fears, speak the truth of God. Love both neighbor and enemy. Forgive as we have been forgiven. Receive grace upon grace, overflowing from the fullness of God. Our hymn is Brethren We Have Met for Worship. Join me in the prayer of invocation. Holy One, you have promised to walk with us and long ago sent your spirit to abide among us and guide us to a future of goodness and hope. We come today seeking your truth, your justice, your kindness. You are with us even now. Help us feel your presence and welcome you once again into our lives. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. 
。阿门。As we come to a time of prayer in our service, I'd like to invite you and remind you again: you can share your prayers by way of、um, our Zoom group chat. You can text me. We continue in prayer for those whom we have named already: Ada and Carl, Bob and Jackie, Lonnie, Lee and Ann, Sue and Terry. And Rusty and Josephine, Royce and Katie, Gertrude, Pat, Jack, Dick, Michael, Judy, Hannah, Jeff, Chad, Eric, Darlene, Billy, Levi, Sandy, John, Sherry. Matt, Mike, Cheryl, Alva, Skyler, Carolyn, Luzvi, Nancy, Marty, Robin, David, Kelly, Tucker and Johanna, Mary, Les, Trisha, Valerie. Rob and Fran, George, Sandra, Doug, Shelley, Susie, Jim, John. We pray for God's spirit of consolation and strength for all who have suffered losses recently. We pray in memory of those. For whom remembrance rocks were placed this week: Nancy Samuelson, Clay Manning, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I invite you to text or chat your prayers now. And as I move into our time of prayer together, continuing, I'm going to do something a little bit different this week. I'd like to invite us to share our prayers captured in one word—a chair, a prayer that's shared on our chat, prayer that's spoken, or a prayer that's held in silence. Just one word. It might be a person, a situation, a place, a feeling, a yearning, a praise. I invite us to lift our hearts to God, seeking God's renewing presence. And what I'll do is,、um, I'll speak a few words slowly, but I hope that our prayer will be all of our words lifted up to God. Together, we pray. Hope. Truth, justice, lament, help. Companionship, nation, nations, reconciliation. Wisdom, peace, humanity, caring, c 
compassion. Relief. Family. Students. Teachers. Violence. Illness. Strength. Healing. Helpers. Empathy. Climate. Together. Vigil. Solace. Trust. Lindsay lifts up prayer of thanks for her mother's new home. She has family with her every day. Marty lifts up prayers for her niece Sue and husband Neil, following Neil's diagnosis of stage four pancreatic cancer. Holy God, gracious and one. Open our hearts to your spirit until your glory is revealed in relentless love in communities transformed by justice and compassion and in the making whole all that is torn asunder. To your love, O oh God, we entrust all for whom we pray and our prayers, both spoken and unspoken. As together we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing our response. Scripture reading is from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verse 10, through chapter 4, verse 11. 
When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, but he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor and for which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And at about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired at about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. When they received that, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last only worked an hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Here end the lessons. Thanks be to God. This song is called Messiah Reigns.
Suzanne, thank you so much. Um, your open spirit and prayerful heart really brings so much through your music. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, before I begin, let me, let me say this. Um, the political posturing that began even before Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's body had grown cold reveals an even deeper layer of necrotic dysfunction in our country. This, along with the self-interested deceit and fatal miscalculations about the pandemic, from the personal to the local to the regional to the national, that have now led to over 200,000 deaths. And hellish fires and quick spawning hurricanes, two different species of canaries keeling over in the coal mine of climate change. The victimization of women and children in our country's detention centers at the border. The forces of racism that provoke violence and poverty and fear the willful blindness to privilege, unregulated militias spreading intimidation and fear, the ambushes and attacks on public servants in the streets. All of this power wielded mercilessly upon the poor and vulnerable, along with nature's reaction to our centuries of myopic exploitation. It all makes me feel small discouraged and fatalistic. A spark of hope flickers and becomes smoke. Though we might have different ideas of how to get there, I suspect that we all sense that things are not the way they could or should be, no matter our political affiliation. I say affiliation because our identity cannot be rooted in the letter next to our preferred candidate's name. As children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to have a higher identity and a bigger family than our political allies. And at times of abject crisis like this, with our very survival at stake, I pray we remember this. So my challenge for us today is this, to take a fresh and sober look at what in us individually and collectively is of God and what isn't? What in us amounts to idolatry of party or ideology? And what comes to us as God's redeeming and transforming word, made incarnate in Jesus, whom we call the Christ, companion to outcasts, good news for the poor, who was himself executed for maintaining a higher loyalty than what empire required. The ember of hope I can feel isn't rooted in human victory or defeat, but in God's victory, already won. The arc of the moral universe bending even now toward a pervasive justice by which we come to know peace. If you too find hope in this faint glow, I hope you'll join me in prayer. In you, with you, through you, may your kingdom come, O God. May your word move within and among us, both now and always. Amen. Today's scripture presents itself as a parable of the kingdom of God. We hear about the landowner's generosity, dispensed in daily wages given to each worker, yet clouded by a conspicuous and provocative equity. We hear the day-long workers grumbling, not at their pay, but at the insult of the late-hour workers being made equal to them. And somehow all this is the kingdom of God. There are two key moments to this parable. One, the landowner's generosity, paying each worker a daily wage. And two, what's more, the landowner doing this in full view. Stanley Saunders wrote, 
the landowner stipulates that those hired last will be paid first. Why? This arrangement serves no evident purpose but to make the gesture of equality evident to those who worked all day. If the goal is to create equality among the workers, the landowner could do so without making a public display. Apparently, they intended to provoke a reaction. While they could have done this privately, the point of the parable isn't just the landowner's generosity, but a purpose, purposeful provocation of the workers who would feel slighted by what the others had been given. Somehow this too is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a squishy thing. We're not sure if it's something we wait for or something we build. Does Jesus praise our patient faith or our hard-working faith? Will we find the kingdom of God after we die? Or will we help construct it in this life, in this world? This parable's answer is yes. The kingdom is to be found both in the indelible and eternal gift of God's grace and our working out our response to this grace. This parable is essentially a nudge by Jesus to get us to consider what is God's and what's on us. Yes, God is generous, gracious, poured out for all. And also, those who feel slighted or diminished by this radical grace must find, feel, love our way to a radical reorientation of values. As the message interpretation puts it, the great reversal. When we grumbling workers can accept the gracious generosity of God and also rejoice with those who have received such generosity, indeed, when we count ourselves among them, then God's kingdom has come. There are two sets of relationships in this parable. The first is the relationship between the landowner and the workers, and essentially a contractual relationship of work that earns a day's wage. The first and second waves of workers each agree to these terms, and it's implied that the subsequent groups have the same understanding. Come and work, and you'll get a day's wage. Customarily, the interpretation of this parable focuses on the landowner's generosity, the desire, the decision to pay each worker a day's wage regardless of how long they'd worked. The parable is seen as an analogy to God's grace. That God's ready dispensing of grace pours out over all. From so-called cradle Christians to deathbed converts. That this is God's kingdom, grace upon grace. If it seems unfair, it's because we don't fully appreciate grace. Or because we've proudly placed ourselves in the day-long worker group. But none of that changes the essence of the parable, which in this understanding is all about us receiving God's grace. Some emphasize the justice of the landowner's generosity, that each worker agreed to a day's wage, and that giving someone less than a day's wage, called a denarii, just enough to be fed for the day, giving less than that would be unjust. It's like flicking a penny at someone and hoping that they can meet their needs by their meal. So the landowner gives everyone what they need, regardless of how many hours they'd worked, and that this is both gracious and just. All this celebrates the relationship between the landowner and the workers, akin to our relationship with God. But it leaves unaddressed the strained relationship among the workers, our relationships with one another under the umbrella of God's grace. As provocative as it was to hear the landowner's gracious generosity, even more provocative is the workers seeing it play out in front of their eyes and the feelings of resentment this so evoked so quickly. And so the second set of relationships in the parable is a relationship between and among the workers. If we listen closely, the source of the day-long worker's resentment isn't over inadequate pay or being owed back pay, 
but it instead stems from their conflation of worth and value. The scripture reads, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us. Isn't that interesting? Let's think about that for a second. Imagine all the other ways they could have lodged their complaint. Hey, we thought we'd get more because we worked more. Hey, we should get a bonus. Hey, we did more work, but none of that. Their complaint is about being set on equal footing. While the value of the late hour workers is certainly less, the landowner, God, insists that their worth is equal. And the day-long folks can't deal with this because they can't see the difference. Turns out so often neither can we. For us, ability, talent, accolades, income, all distill to worth. Stanley Saunders again writes, we shape our identities and our sense of worth by constantly comparing and contrasting ourselves with others. We want fairness and equality when it serves our interest, but not if it means that we all get the same prize in the end. I think he's right. In the Bible study this week, we wondered if the parable might feel different if the analogy weren't about labor and wages, but about a banquet. Turns out Jesus has concerns about that too. Remember the parable in Luke of a banquet where the seats are all arranged in a particular hierarchy and how we should choose our seat humbly? Even today we know examples of exclusive, socially stratified feasting. Imagine just for a moment if a day laborer entered the pot and kettle or one of Princeton's supper clubs and took a seat. Imagine. So the workers grumble. The early ones resent being made equal. And the late day workers perhaps were made to feel ashamed or unworthy. The parable doesn't present a neat and tidy realized kingdom, but one still emerging. God is generous while the workers grumble. This is the second aspect of the parable. The kingdom isn't just about God's generosity, but about our capacity to learn not to confuse worth with value. A plea for us to understand deeply that we are beloved and cherished far beyond the measure of our bank accounts, the job we hold, the clothes we wear, or the car we drive, or every other external measure of worth we so readily wrap ourselves in. And so is everyone else too. As provocative as this object lesson was for the day-long workers and for Jesus' listeners, so it is for us. All of the markers of identity, status, hierarchy, affiliation, indeed all that we cling to to orient ourselves in society, Jesus says none of that matters. He calls us all laborers together for the kingdom of God, whether early or late, and calls us beloved. Like turning off radar in the fog, it can be terrifying and disorienting to relinquish the cultural markers of identity, to take on our identity and worth as children of God, brothers and sisters, not only to Christ, but also to each other. It's humbling. I came across a quote this week by Albert Einstein. He wrote, A hundred times a day I remind myself that my inner and outer life depend on the labors of other people, both living and dead, and that I must exert myself in order to give in the full measure I have received and am still receiving. Today's parable means that the kingdom of God is unfinished. It's not only a static sense of God's generosity, but a still unfolding reality. And that only when we can esteem each other accurately, when we celebrate one another's joys and grieves one another's hardships, and when we see each other the way God sees us, only then will God's kingdom come. When we do this, then and only then 
will we know both justice and peace. Amen. Our hymn is for the fruit of all creation. together in our benediction. We go out as laborers in God's upside-down kingdom, where the last are first and the first are last, where needs are met in miracle, and there is grace enough for all. May the blessing of God, the love of Christ, and the presence of the Spirit surround us and sustain us in these coming days. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Beloved, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine. Amen.
Good morning again and welcome and I'm grateful that we can be here together. Um, you have the ability, I believe, to unmute yourselves if you haven't done that already. And we, we will continue with the time of, um, what do we call it, Zoom coffee hour. So, good morning, Joel and Sharon and Gary and Sharon, Anna and Doug and Linda I see, Kathy, Lindsay, Scott and Debbie, Norma, you're, it, I think you're there, but it kind of looks like a Christmas tree. <laughs> Steve and Rich and Laura, Al, Ellen, maybe Ken, Suzanne, 